Collective bargaining plays an important role in ensuring decent work. Ordinarily, the balance of power in negotiations between employers and individual workers is in favour of employers. When workers negotiate as a group, however, the negotiations are less unfair. Negotiations between employers and such organised groups of workers are a key mechanism for determining the terms and conditions of employment. Usually, the entities that negotiate on behalf of a group or several groups of workers are known as trade unions. Previously in this course, we also learned that the right of workers to bargain collectively is an important one in Indian law. Under the Constitution of India, workers have the fundamental right to form trade unions or associations which represent their demands and concerns. We also learned, however, that there are severe restrictions on the ability of workers and their unions to strike work. Hello and welcome back to the third module of this course on Decent Work for Women. The law recognizes its critical function for improving the conditions of work, but we need to consider the special barriers that women and informal workers face in organizing themselves to negotiate as a group. So, uh, in order for a movement with domestic workers to, to be efficient, or at least to yield um, the necessary force that uh, is needed for social movement, is to have domestic workers um, articulate their own claims. You know, so the phrase, nothing for us without us, is, uh, is very important in that sense. And uh, at the same time, and this is where we see the tension, it can be very difficult because of the necessity to remain uh, anonymous, for example. Um, but I would say that this is the, the strategy that I would um, encourage um, more generally. And then secondly, um, I would say that uh, going, uh, working with trade unions has been uh, very efficient. It means that not having silos in this uh, in this struggle, but more really uh, joining forces. Um, and also, the most important is to really have an intersectional lens to it. It means that um, having uh, domestic workers work together with sex workers, working together with construction workers, because what needs to be um, uh, combated here is not is not anything that is specific to the care sector. It's a global system of exploitation that relies on the hierarchization of workers. So it means that having struggles or having movements that work in silos, they will continue to be uh, weakened if they are not working together. And that's, I think, a strategy that needs to be highlighted, that needs to be encouraged, and that needs to be recognized as absolutely essential and uh, uh, inescapable. Uh, so, so certainly in terms of that transition, uh, the, the, the whole the issue of women being involved in um, fighting for and claiming their rights. And I think a really important point to make before, and again, the back, I think you really have to start with the background to this. Um, as far as I'm aware, I don't know all countries, but certainly the countries I'm familiar with, historically women have ever only gained rights through collective action. I mean, the, I'm, a, I'm um, from the UK, uh, and the obvious example is the suffragettes. Um, until a hundred years ago, women had, were not allowed to vote. They had very limited property rights. They had very limited um, rights, uh, independent rights, independent of their father or their husband. Um, and it was a big struggle by the suffragettes to get women the right to vote and get women on um, uh, all sorts of other rights which were then able to follow on um, from that and, and equally things like um, Equal Pay Act and gender equality laws have, have come about through struggles by women, um, Dagenham, women working in the Dagenham car plant for example were really played a critical role um, in the UK in, in triggering and leave and, and, and fighting for uh, the rights of women. So I think that that, that is, is a really important broad point to make. Um, the second, uh, and, and I think that still exists today, that's not changed, we have to, it's a, it's a continual struggle. But we are now in an era where I think there's greater recognition uh, internationally and nationally um, of uh, women's rights. It's, it's better enshrined in law, not in all countries. In some countries, 
you know, there are definite major serious issues still of just basic um, equal rights, but in many countries it is better enshrined in law. Um, but what's enshrined in law is still not experienced in reality. So there's a big shift difference, if you like, between the, the, the kind of legal struggles and achieving on paper, gains on paper and the reality. And, and equal pay would be an obvious example of that. I don't know any country, even those with equal pay acts um, and, and legislation on equal pay where women have equal pay. Um, and that glass ceiling persists at every level in, 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 in virtually all societies. Some better and some worse, but it persists everywhere. So the first challenge is the risk that they are taking. I was saying about that earlier. The second challenge that they face is um, very simply racism in structures that are uh, predominantly white. If I'm you know, thinking of Germany here, for example, or even you know, France, those structures are predominantly white and predominantly as well Marxist and non-intersectional which means that they will not recognize the specific ways in which um, women of color, migrant women are affected. And they will tend to reduce the whole phenomenon, the whole problem to the class aspect, which is definitely a class aspect, but not only. And so if we do not add to it, um, you know, other systems like patriarchy and racism, um, then it becomes very difficult for uh, these types of worker to come forward and to gain a voice in um, trade unions that have been predominantly white, predominantly male, and also predominantly Marxist in nature. Trade unions had originally emerged to represent the interests of the male breadwinner, who was a man working a formal job in a factory. They were in many cases unable to adequately represent the interests of women workers who bear a disproportionate burden of unpaid care work and to whom most formal sector jobs remained unavailable. The, um, the image of the worker we had from the mid 20th century, from the 1930s to the 40s, 50s, was the auto worker, the steel worker, the man of brawn. And there's these wonderful, if, if we were, um, if I was showing you a PowerPoint, I'd have these images from uh, these heroic odds, kind of like socialist realism, but you also had that in the US under the New Deal. These men of brawn with their yeah, bare chests and their strong arms, you know. Well, by the 1990s, the new face of labor had been the home care worker, had been the service sector worker. We have shifted globally in some places, you know, it's uneven and unequal development globally. We know that the global supply chains for industry have gone uh, elsewhere, but in, we've become in the US a service economy and a, and a financial sector economy. And so the face of labor has changed. When we think of essential workers today, they are jobs that are either feminized or dominated by bio women, by women. Um, uh, that they are healthcare, uh, and, it's, and it's mostly the nurses and the healthcare aides, uh, you, the attendants in hospitals and outside. It's retail, it's restaurant industry, it's business services. So with the very shifts in economic life, the structures of organization have shifted as well. First thing, the law excludes many workers as really workers. They're not defined as employees. This is the most egregious that just happened in California. Everything begins in California. <laughs> I have to tell you, um, with Proposition 22 that uh, infamously passed in which Uber and Lyft essentially uh, overturned both the courts and the legislature in defining the people that uh, the drivers as uh, independent contractors rather than as employees. Uh, fewer and fewer people, though, are defined any longer as traditional employees that so, and you can't find the employer through these attenuated contracting out 
people are temporary workers, etc. So new labor formations are needed uh, because even nurses, so many get defined uh, as supervisors and thus they're outside of the bargaining unit. And yet, if we look where the movement and the labor movement has been, it has been nurses, it has been home health care and child, jan child care workers, janitors, uh, hospital workers of all types. It's been in the service sector, but it is, but the service sector then has come under attack. And it's been where you've had these anti union. Uh, legal cases being brought. So where it is difficult to win unionization, other formations have taken place. As the old, the garment workers unions and the textile workers unions, uh, which became Unite, Union, union of Needle, um, Industrial and, tex and um, Textile Workers, it merged with HERE, the Hotel and Restaurant Workers Union. But really most of the work had, that unionized work was no longer in um, the garment industry. And yet you began to have the new sweatshops. What emerged are worker centers in uh, low waged work areas, uh, like the LA Garment Worker Center, catering to an immigrant workforce, organizing people in terms of their rights, giving legal advice. The, it is not a union formation, but others are closer, like the day laborer network. Uh, so this is another consequence of immigrant workers, some documented, some not, coming to this country, being pushed out of their uh, countries of origin and creating uh, you have these new networks. Well, let's just think firstly of what types of organization. And I think that's the first thing to think about. <clears throat> Traditionally, when you had that sort of more traditional gender division of labor, um, the trade unions are the main workplace organizations, um, independent trade unions that can represent workers, can negotiate with employers and be involved in, in pressuring government, etc in relation to, to the, any legal changes. But when you had a more traditional gender division of labor, trade unions tended to be dominated uh, by men because men were the majority of the paid workforce. I mean that was they reflected that kind of uh, gender division of labor and, and, and traditional workforce. Now we have a much more diverse economy, labor, particularly uh, in terms of labor force, women play a much more uh, important role and much higher labor force, uh, female labor force participation than previously. Um, uh, so trade unions are, are kind of varied in the extent to which they've been able to integrate women in. And I think it depends in part by sector sectors which are, are much more dominated by by women women have played a critical role um, and been able to move up within the trade unions sectors which are more traditionally male women have maybe struggled more so i think there's an issue there in terms of wet workplace organization um, and um, and how the extent to which trade unions have been able to represent women and particularly um, when women have been brought into the workforce on sort of casual, part-time, temporary types of work, much more difficult to organize um, in that circumstance. Gendered social norms also restrict the ability of women workers to organize. Women who bear the burden of unpaid care work at home may not have the time or other resources necessary for organizational work. Second thing I think that's very important though is the other point reflects the other point that I made, which is that women who are in the workplace continue to often um, undertake the majority of paid, unpaid care within their own homes. So when they finish work um, uh, at the end of a shift, for example, they haven't got time to go to a trade union meeting or to organize um, or to be part of a trade union organization if they have to get back. 
and, and feed and care for their children, collect them from school, collect them from childcare, etc., etc. So it makes it much more difficult for women themselves to participate. But keeping that in mind, um, I think there's a third area, and this is an area where, um, where you're beginning to see um, some change taking place. It's is that that women are therefore often much more engaged at the household and community level when they're outside of work, but they're constantly juggling the paid and unpaid activities. And I think what you've seen is the growth of, of more community-based NGOs. These are not independent trade unions, very important, but that they help to, they can play a role in organizing women workers when they're in their community and household um, environment. So I think we've sort of seen shifts in the types of, of organization. Some unions have been, um, trade unions have been much more alert um, in, in really promoting gender equality. Um, certainly in my own area of food, um, I, I, I do a lot of my own research is um, in agriculture. So um, the International Union of Food Workers, uh, I know has been very quite proactive in promoting gender. It has now has a, a women play a dominant role in, in, in its leadership. The general secretary is a woman. Um, and there are other unions um, that are, are similar. Um, so that you can find some very good examples, but there are also laggards. Um, and of course, that's an international organization. There's a lot of difference between the national unions that make up the international um, organization. Uh, some are more proactive, some are more laggard. Um, but I think in terms of um, where you get a more effective organization is where you get collaboration, if you like, or at least acknowledgement um, uh, and, and even better collaboration between those uh, workplace trade unions who are actually based in the workplace and represent workers in that context and the broader uh, community-based organizations who, who help to support workers outside of that organized context. The low wages and long hours of work in a garment unit in southern India, as we have learned previously in this course, may be the products of business choices made further up the value chain. Associations of workers that have traditionally organized around a workplace or in opposition to their immediate employer have largely not been able to influence such decisions. Other organizations such as NGOs and human rights organizations have had more success, especially when they work along with workers' organizations. So there are examples of where you get greater collaboration between those different types of organization. Um, and I think uh, also very important in the global economy uh, to remember that, that Whereas traditionally uh, the, the, the employment relationship was just between the worker and workers and their employer, increasingly with globalization and global value chains, there are many other commercial actors in the value chain who can also, who aren't the employer, but can who also affect the terms and conditions of work. So for example, a large global buyer uh, will set the prices that a supplier pay that, that is paid to the supplier, which will determine the amount of wages uh, or, or have a significant effect on the level of wages that the supplier can pay and the terms and conditions of employment. For example, if the buyer alters the orders constantly, uh, there's a lot of volatility in the ordering that's given at very short notice, the supplier will then use a lot of very flexible workers who come in and out depending on the volatility of the orders and women are particularly concentrated in that type of flexible work so so it's also important to remember that that the given the context the changing context in which work takes place when you have the organization of workers it's not simply organizing them in relation to the direct employer especially when that employer constantly changes. It's a very casual type of employment relationship. So what increasingly you've got are alliances um, between more traditional trade union, worker organizations, NGOs, but also in the context of the global economy, between NGOs uh, and trade unions at a national level and at an international level. 
And that's where I think you can begin to see leverage. And an example that I use is the Kenya flower industry um, and, well, and Uganda flower industry, but I'll, I'll, I'll focus more in on the Kenya one. Um, if 20 years ago, um, in the late 80s, women, uh, women were, the majority, were the majority of workers in the Kenya flower sector, 70 plus workers, 70% plus of the workforce. They were largely concentrated in temporary jobs, so they very rarely had, or very few of them, um, had permanent contracts. Um, but this was a year-round industry, so they would work 11 months, they'd be laid off for a month, then re-employed on a new contract, so they never became permanent, so they never got the rights of a permanent worker. Um, they were subject, uh, the, the majority of the supervisors and the managers were men, um, uh, and the women were often subject to sexual harassment um, and other forms of discrimination and abuse and because they were on temporary contracts they could, couldn't be full-time members of the trade union they weren't organized they didn't have independent voice therefore um, uh, and their pay and conditions were very poor including um, serious health and safety issues such as flower workers working in the greenhouses were um, when the spraying um, took place in the greenhouses for an example um, uh, if a re-entry wasn't meant to be for three hours, the supervisor might pressure them, workers, to go back into the greenhouse an hour later to, to get the delivery through and keep the orders moving. Um, and that is a serious health threat, not only to women workers, but also potentially reproductive health threat and potentially to the children. So this was 20 years ago, serious, serious issues. Um, and this was this there were campaigns that were led to some extent by the trade union within Kenya but also increasingly by NGOs and uh, human rights organizations within Kenya who linked up to, to international organizations um, um, including Oxfam um, and others um, and really began to put pressure not only on the employers to improve the conditions of the workers but also to put pressure on the buyers of the flowers to pressure the, 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 the flower growers to improve the conditions of workers. So you had a sort of more grassroots pressure, uh, both within the workplace and outside, and you had international pressure um, from outside. And people like the International Union Food Workers were also drawn into those campaigns. So, so this was both more traditional forms of organization and more civil society forms of organization. And gradually over time, the pressure, particularly from the buyers, forced some of the suppliers, the better growers, not all, there are still poor grow growers in Kenya that have poor conditions, but the better, the larger, the more progressive and the better of the growers began to improve the conditions. One of the key things they did was to turn those temporary contracts into permanent contracts. Once women workers had permanent contracts, they could join a trade union and become full members. Um, they weren't subject to the whim of their supervisor as to whether they would work the next day um, or get a job the next week because they now had the guarantee of a permanent contract. Um, they also set up gender committees um, as well as having better gender representation on health and safety and worker committees so that women's voice could be heard. So if issues arose, they had mechanisms of complaint, mechanisms of remedy. Um, and certainly in the research I've been involved in, I've been involved in research in Kenya flowers and horticulture over, over on and off over a, a number of years. Um, we've seen a lot of improvements, um, particularly for women workers. And women workers are increasingly now moving up into the supervisory positions and even the management positions. So you don't have that same imbalance and inequality across the, the labor force that you used to have. There are still problems. Uh, incomes are still, real incomes are still low. They've had wage improvements, but with rising prices, the, the real income um, is still low and also they've um, uh, there are better flower growers and there are poor ones that don't implement the better conditions 
so there is it's a constant um, struggle but but i've certainly seen change take place in that circumstance trade unions have traditionally organized in relation to a specific workplace or a particular employer but more and more workers as we have learned especially in developing nations are now employed on a non regular basis without a single identifiable employer most informal workers in developing nations are women new forms of association have arisen to respond to such challenges the self employed women's association in india which is a very large um, uh, organization of of informal workers um in india uh, really started at a grassroots level um as a civil society organization organizing women in the informal economy who didn't have access to traditional methods of organization or permanent or regular types of work um who were largely overlooked and negated by the traditional trade unions um and who were were overlooked um uh, and marginalized by government and in relation to social protection in terms of protection of their rights etc uh, but what say we did um and it was established many years ago is that it also fought to become a trade union and it was a long struggle on the part of sewa uh, and sewa i should say was also led by its leadership is female the membership is female um it it organizes women in many ways microfinance as a sewa bank um it organizes uh, in relation to social protection uh, it organizes in relation to campaigns to get local authorities local government to um improve the legislation and the protection of informal workers and it covers workers in many different types of sectors as well but what say what also did was to 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 um struggle and and to become a recognized trade union which it did finally do and there's still some resistance to its role as a trade union um but but i think that was a very important step forward in terms of an organization that was able to straddle both the sort of community level types of organization which are critical for women who are not in the more traditional workplace um but but with combining that with the more traditional forms of organization and representation uh, which gave them much stronger voice much greater recognition not only within india but within india but also i think on the international stage so say we through its activities has also become um much better recognized internationally it it has a, an important voice within the international labor organization when anything any issues come up that relate to informal workers um and in many other un uh, bodies and and other international bodies um so it's an example of where women particularly can be involved in in organizing seva stands for self employed women's association and it is a trade union of women in the informal economy uh the informal economy in india is very large um i think it's over 90% if you in agriculture and about 80% if you don't and um the workers those who work in the informal economy uh have a variety of types of work ranging from wage work salaried work daily wage work uh then piece rated work and was all types of self employment uh from very small own account workers to family businesses to micro entrepreneurs in 1972 seva was registered as a trade union uh of women in the informal economy we called it self employed because that was a respectable name uh we wanted to give dignity to the workers and seva of course you know in indian languages stands for service for the uh, hindi or gujarati a uh, term is more uh, it explains more is swashrai mahila seva sang swashrai means by her own work mahila of course is women seva is it's a service uh, service is important 
and Sangha's uh, organization are coming together. So we started with a group of uh, head loaders, women who carry loads on the head, and then moved to different trades, uh, street vendors, and then the home-based workers. During the 1990s, Seva was at the forefront of the campaign for the Home Workers Convention, or C-177, about which we learned previously in this course. Seva built alliances among associations of home workers across the world and with international trade union federations to bring the issue of home workers before the International Labour Organization. Many of the methods that were used in the campaign connected informal home workers associations around the world with large international trade unions. These methods have also been used in other campaigns to establish international labor standards and then to use those standards to influence national law and policy. So the campaign for domestic worker rights was very much on the ground and it kind of came out organically uh, in places like Hong Kong and uh, Colombia and Peru and the Caribbean, Latin American women and Asian women, particularly with so many Filipinos and Indonesians uh, as migrant domestic workers in Asia. Uh, there were these associations that were created from organizing. Uh, sometimes these groups are connected, uh, many of them in Latin America, to the formal labor uh, organizations, the peak labor organizations of their countries. That was quite apparent in Uruguay, where we had the first uh, International Domestic Worker Federation, the founding meeting in 2013, but I'm getting ahead of my story. Uh, in other areas, these uh, formations or proto-unions, or they were uh, connected to ethnic associations or women's groups, but laborite women's groups. Uh, and, but it came from the ground in Latin America and in Asia uh, that created their own regional uh, organizations. And, at, and because at Beijing initially, so these uh, UN conferences on women were very important for getting uh, at least leadership from these organizations together in contact with each other. And, uh, in, and so as early as 1995 in Beijing, there were conversations uh, about uh, some sort of larger domestic worker uh, or organization, union, a global initiative. And, but it took until about uh, 2005. And there um, in the Netherlands was quite important. Uh, uh, Irene, which was about uh, international restructuring in Europe uh, and the condition of domestic, uh, migrant domestic workers in the Netherlands and elsewhere, uh, connected with the uh, peak labor union in the Netherlands. And there was an international meeting that brought together uh, domestic worker activists and organizers from all over the world. So some of the women that came from the US were migrant domestic workers at one point of their lives from one of the women who came from California, uh, Juanita Flores, for example, uh, was originally from Colombia, Latin America. Uh, many of the uh, domestic worker leaders in the US uh, are either from Mexico or uh, their families were, uh, or from the Philippines. And these groups got together in the Netherlands and with some ILO folks, folks from the international uh, unions, uh, and they decided to try to get a convention. And it took a number, a few years, but uh, there was tremendous support. And it was because of the training and the support of WIGO on one hand, and the international union federations on the other, particularly um, the, uh, the IUF, which is uh, 
really one of the major supporters of low wage workers uh, around the world and in the global south. And has always had uh, a very anti-imperial uh, democratic and solidaristic uh, standpoint, at least since Gallen was uh, head of it. Uh, he's now retired and, uh, and was, um, but he was very active in helping to form what became the International Domestic Worker Network that went to Geneva as an NGO uh, to, uh, to argue for the convention. Now, in the ILO, the way it's organized as a tripartite organization, governments, workers, and employers, but organizations of workers and employers, there is nowhere for NGOs to actually vote or have a say unless the governments and the workers, or maybe the employers, that doesn't happen much, open up a space for them. And so uh, what, what happened was that the, at the beginning of the deliberations, there were two-year deliberation, the IDW, uh, the IDON people, uh, could talk in uh, committees. They could be on committees, some of them. They could talk at the beginning. Some of them did come, even from, from the first uh, discussion in 2010, as, uh, as advisors to their government. Uh, Myrtle Witteboy, who uh, was uh, head of the South African Domestic Workers Group, and then became head of the International Domestic Workers Network, and now is head of the Federation, uh, was an advisor. So she could speak as an advisor, but she didn't have a vote. Uh, and what the women did is they went, and the few men, because there were African men in particular, that, uh, and a couple of men from Asia that were uh, representing domestic worker groups, they went to the streets. They campaigned in the streets. They had demonstrations. It was a huge quilt that uh, the Asian Women's Net Migrant Network and they paraded it through the streets of Geneva. Geneva no one had ever seen this before uh, with the state ILO. So they brought social movement tactics to Geneva to publicize to the whole world, both the conditions uh, with storytelling, that's particularly of, uh, there was some Indonesian women who talked about uh, being child laborers and domestic work. Uh, there, there were these, what I call appeals to the heart. It was a creation of affect. That's a strategy. Uh, one that, you know, those of us who want to see everything just in terms of rights and justice uh, sometimes are uncomfortable with because it paints the worker as a victim and it's appealing to their betters, to their employers, et cetera. But it can be a very effective strategy as long as it's combined with the demand for rights and dignity and recognition and self-agency. And uh, they also would have press conferences every day. They would, uh, they, women were trained, WIGO was very uh, important with that, in messaging and speaking to the press. They would wear t-shirts uh, when they would uh, ch start chanting and singing. Uh, in meetings, which was forbidden at the ILO, uh, they, you know, said, so we're going to kick you out. Uh, uh, then they just wore t-shirts. And But at the end, uh, uh, when the convention finally was uh, passed, they unfold a big banner uh, in the uh, main hall of the ILC you know, uh, saying that, you know, now it's onward to ratification. And the ILO had never seen these social movement tactics brought into. There was a particularly obnoxious um, employer delegate from the United States, a San Francisco uh, banker, businessman, who, uh, who complained and complained in his time to talk about uh, how 
he was being hounded, and he was, because he wouldn't talk with the delegate, uh, de the delegation that uh, the National Domestic Workers Alliance had brought over. And these people, they had clashed with him, uh, some of the women organizers and workers back in uh, the US. And he says, this is illegitimate, these people shouldn't be talking, et cetera, et cetera. But then there were other government uh, and worker delegates who told their stories about beginning uh, life as a child domestic worker. These were men from the Caribbean, for example. Uh, and yes, people are getting too enthusiastic. And yes, somebody tried to vote, but they didn't understand the rules. And they weren't trying to, I mean, this, this guy was like pre-Trump Trump, Trump uh, in terms of his understanding of democracy. But they did break through. And in the second year, more were members of official delegations. And some of the countries actually had domestic workers cast their votes for the government or for the workers. Uh, this is great, a wonderful victory. What does it mean though on the ground? That's, that's the question. What did it really mean on the ground? And that's where the ratification campaigns, people went back and to educate. So in the US, uh, which rarely ratifies any ILO conventions, although it always tries to shape them, uh, although I was told by Manuela uh, Tommy, uh, who was the ILO staff person, now head of the conditions of work um, uh, section, at the time, uh, when the I, when in committee, the U.S. representative voted yes, people just started crying um, because it was it was an Obama uh, error uh, person, but because the U.S. always votes no or or abstains or uh, it was it was very moving to people to see that the people who had been going year after year, but. Um, but in the US, uh, we've had these campaigns by the National Domestic Workers Alliance and groups in various states for what are called bills of rights, uh, domestic worker bills of rights, because, because of the legacy of slavery in which black women were, became associated with household employment and black men initially, uh, because of the power of the Southern Dixie Cracks, as they were called, the segregationists in the Congress. In the 1930s, when the Roosevelt administration under the New Deal created labor standards in the US, the Fair Labor Standards Act for minimum wages and maximum hours and the end of child labor, uh, the right to collective bargaining uh, uh, and unemployment, social security, and later, when we got occupational health and safety in uh, the early 1970s, domestic workers were excluded. So were agricultural workers. Those were the jobs that black and brown people and immigrants of color by that time dominated. And that was the deal to get it passed, to get the votes of the Southern Southerners in Congress. Now, the way in which laws you build upon them. So uh, the Secretary of Labor at that time, Frances Perkins, was known as a half of loaf girl. If she could get the law on the books, then you could expand the coverage. And that was the rationale. And in fact, domestic workers, uh, some of them got under the social security, our pension system uh, in the early 1950s. And that in the 1970s, uh, finally, domestic workers got under the Fair Labor Standards Act, although one group, the home health care workers, were carved out of it. They were redefined as elder companions and not employees. I mean, it become, but how do you enforce this stuff? Uh, domestic workers are still not in the Occupational Health and Safety Act, for example. And we, so you get these new formations beginning in the early 2000s, in New York in particular, that are ethnic associations, they're Filipino women, they're Caribbean women, 
uh, their uh, cotton, uh, women from the Americas. They create, they form Domestic Workers United and they start lobbying first in the city level of New York City and then New York State for a Domestic Worker Bill of Rights to have hours, uh, get, uh, you know, guarantees that if you're a living worker, you can't just be fired tomorrow and you're out in the street. You, you'd have two weeks notice, uh, people would have hours, they'd have occupational health, they'd have a grievance, et cetera. Uh, they found um, a lobbying partner in Jews for Economic and Social Justice, uh, and they had other uh, employer allies. And they won in 2010 a Domestic Worker Bill of Rights that uh, isn't as strong as the other labor standard, but it has some enforcement mechanism. And in fact, this is how the dialectic goes. They win this. It's announced in 2010 at the ILO in June. And this becomes then another pushing forward for the global. So this is this interaction. You, the, you get the convention, 189, the domestic worker, a decent work for domestic workers at the ILO, and that's brought back to countries like the US. And so the, there was a campaign at that moment in California, and the uh, video would go, you know, first uh, New York, then Hawaii, which was actually done by just the legislature. It wasn't an organizing campaign. Then the ILO, next California. It was like, now California didn't get it then. The, the governor vetoed it. It was a Republican governor, Arnold Schwarzenegger at the time. But, um, but California eventually did. And the, but got a very limited Bill of Rights that really only covers overtime. It covers hours and uh, requires overtime pay. It's very limited. And Massachusetts, however, modeled its bill after the ILO, not only the convention, but the recommendations, which included, you know, such things as uh, you couldn't take the passport away from someone. Uh, people had to have um, the kind access to, to food security and the kind of food they wanted. And uh, a bunch of other um, about um, safety and health and things like that. Massachusetts was able to have a more robust law because domestic workers, uh, thanks to uh, black women, cl club women in the uh, early 70s had gotten domestic workers on the minimum wage. And the Massachusetts Commission uh, Against Discrimination like the New York one, were, were uh, pre-existing uh, mechanisms for enforcement. But you can see how this works. I think also within the more traditional trade union movement, I mean, we're seeing now more women uh, uh, rising to leadership positions within the traditional labor movement. So the ITUC, the International Trade Union Congress, has um, uh, a woman, uh, Sharon Burroughs, who's, who's been leading that organization for a long time. It's very effective, very vocal. Um, and um, at the International Union of Food Workers uh, has a woman, uh, Sue Longley, who is uh, the General Secretary. And again, very strong, very vocal. So, so we're getting much more examples of women rising up within the traditional trade unions. There are others as well, but those are the two, two obvious ones. Um, and, and I think slowly the trade unions themselves are beginning to change um, and I've certainly got examples of that, of, of how they organise workers, um, how they relate to workers. It's partly a gender issue but it's also partly a recognition of the flexibility of labour. Uh, an obvious example is, is in food. Um, a lot of the flexible and casual workers are female, they constantly move around just because food production it, it is historically, it's seasonal I and mean, there's nothing you can do. So there's a lot of migrant labor in food production. The problem 
with migrant workers, internal migrant workers, or they cross international borders because moving between different production locations according to the season, very difficult to organize. So what the IUF did was introduce a passport, a uni, uni passport, union passport, so that women, or so workers could uh, have the passport and then move between different employers, between different locations, and still carry that with them so they would be a recognized member of the trade union. And that helps to organize those more dispersed, uh, both workers, both male and female, but women are so often concentrated in that type of work. I think it's an important gender um, issue. In this video, we learned about the barriers that women workers face in organizing themselves to negotiate for better conditions of work. We noted how community-based organizations may be better suited to represent their interests compared to traditional trade unions. Over time, community-based organizations have worked with networks of trade unions to advocate for the rights of women workers, while traditional trade unions have evolved to better represent the interests of women workers. In this module on the agenda to realize decent work for women, we learned about the need to transform gendered social norms about work and the strategies to mainstream and visibilize informal work. We have now learned about the kind of organizations that can do such work. Thank you for watching.